The following interview was conducted with Dr. Edwin H. Page for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, August the 27th, 2008 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. Page. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and your early years. I was born in Glasgow, Kentucky in 1920. My parents are Ora and Leo, uh, Leo Page. I was born on a farm in, in, in Glasgow, or near Glasgow. I went to school in Glasgow, graduated from high school, and in 1936. Uh, from there, I... Well, tell, tell us a little bit about what high school, how large the school was it? It and was a... Were there any activities that you participate in, student clubs? Oh, I was, uh, I played in the band in high school, all through high school. What instrument did you play? I played trumpet. Okay. I've always enjoyed music and musical programs, and I played the trumpet and during high school, and then we had a National Guard, a cavalry unit there that had a band and played on horses. And I've always liked horses, and I joined the cavalry band, and we played on horses. And I stayed in that cavalry band after college while I was at Western Kentucky uh, University, and I stayed in the cavalry for five years. Very good. Did you play at the high school football games and things? We played at the, at the high school football games. We weren't a marching band. Okay. Um, I guess they th thought we couldn't march well enough to match. At least we had no training in, in marching at all. The horses were it. Yes. No, I couldn't use the horses in the band at all. Of course, that, they were in the cavalry, and they wouldn't allow those horses on the football field. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then after high school, where did you go to college? And Went to college at Bowling Green, Kentucky, Western Kentucky University. At that time, it was called Western Kentucky State Teachers College. I went there on a music scholarship, which helped me considerably because it, in 1936 was right during the Depression, and I had have two brothers, one older and one younger. The, the older brother was in, in the business university at that time, and it was quite a strain on the finances for my parents to send me to school, I thought. And so I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship uh, that paid my tuition and so forth at, uh, at Western while there. And I was lucky enough that that scholarship continued for the four years that I was there. Good. What was college like and how large a school and what clubs and things? What it meant you were probably played with them in music too. But since you had a music scholarship. Yeah, well, I, I had to major in music, I felt, because of my scholarship, but I always liked biology and that sort of uh, thing when I was younger in high school. And I also took a double major in, in, in college, in, in biology and in music. And my senior year was fortunate enough to get a position in the, or get a job in the biology lab, and I enjoyed that thoroughly. Mm -hmm. enjoyed working with the students, even though I was a student myself. Mm -hmm. Did you live on campus? No, I lived off campus. I lived at a, at a rooming house where we had room, board, all, all together. Did they provide meals? They provided meals. Mm -hmm. At okay. that time, room and board for a month was $18 a month. Wow. Very good. Yeah, very good. Um, how large was your class? How large was your uh, class? This, how many students in your class? Uh, there were about, as I recall, about 400 students in our in my class. Uh -huh. Well, good. Okay. Then, um, after, was there any professors that uh, sort of made an impact? Do you remember any of them that you got got used to some of the professors? Did you meet anyone that was particularly that you got to know? Yes, I met. Uh, Two really that know real well. Uh, one was my major professor in biology, and he was a, a tremendous influence on me in wanting to go ahead and, and pursue uh, a biological area of some kind eventually. Good. Okay. Well, after, when did you graduate then? What year? Graduated from Western in 1940. Okay. 
and then what was next? Next, I taught school in Louisville, Kentucky High School, uh, school for a year. Uh, then I married at, uh, in August of that year, 1941, when I finished that year. Where did you meet your wife, while you were in college? Uh, I met my wife while I was in college. She came from a small town that was about uh, 45 miles from my home. And from, my wife had a brother that worked for DuPont Company in the nylon area, and he kept encouraging me to apply to DuPont and go to work in nylon, that there would be a lot of room for advancement uh, there in nylon particularly because nylon was just becoming popular at the time. And so I resigned my position in teaching in Louisville and applied to uh, DuPont for nylon plant in Martinsville, Virginia, and they accepted it, and so we moved there in October of uh, 41. Okay. I stayed there until late 42, and the draft, and my brother was already been drafted, and my number came up very shortly, and I knew I was going to be drafted, and so I decided that I was going to join the Navy instead. The reason that I decided to join the Navy is in 1941, with the cavalry band that I was in, we had always gone to Frankfort, Kentucky for a summer training period, and in 41 they sent us to Wisconsin, and they shipped the horses up there by rail and they put us in the back of a ton and a half truck with a canvas top and the back open. <laughs> and when we got to our destination in Wisconsin, we were all sick from the fumes of oh, yes. exhaust fumes. And Wisconsin, I've never seen as many big mosquitoes in my life. They were about the size of hornets. And I made the decision then that if I had to go into service, I was, I was going to join the Navy because as long as I had a bed, it would be dry, and I didn't think there'd be any mosquitoes there. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> hmm. When you got, then you got, uh, you signed up for the Navy? Then I, I signed up for the Navy. They sent me to Columbia University for a three-month midshipman school, and I graduated from there. There's a 90-day wonder, they called him, and was commissioned an ensign and then received orders to report to the West Coast and aboard the USS Louisville, a heavy cruiser. And I went there, and my wife went back to Kentucky. To She was working there, where she worked, and I went to California, and they said that the ship would be there in, in uh, about two weeks, and I called my wife and told her to come on out. We had about two weeks there to see the area. And next morning I reported in, and they said, you're going to leave this morning, you're going up to the Aleutian Islands. So I had to call my wife and cancel her trip. Oh, no. And they, I went to the Aleutian Islands and went to ADAC, and picked up the ship there after about a month going back and forth from one island to the other up there. And finally picked up my ship in uh, early, 19, early 1943. And then we stayed in the Pacific for the next three years. Did you see some combat? A lot, a lot of, a lot of quite a fit, bit of combat, yes. Mm -hmm. We were assigned, we carried an admiral on there that was in charge of a task force for a bombardment force that softened up the Pacific Islands for the Marines to land. So we, our first encounter was at Roy and Namur, a couple of small islands. Then we went to Saipan, to Tinian, to Kwajalein, then eventually out to Guam, and then eventually into the Philippines. Bomb Quite extensive. Bombarding for the uh, Marines to land. 
my responsibility on the ship uh, after the first few months was division officer for the five inch guns. And my battle station was right in front of the bridge. And we had two turrets of three guns each, eight inch guns uh, that made up uh, our fire post in front, the two turrets, and then we had four five inch guns on the side that made up and then a bunch of automatic weapons and that sort of thing. And uh, after the Pacific, we were in the, the Lingay and Gulf battle where our troops landed at, uh, on the Philippines. And Is that that, where, isn't that where MacArthur came back? Was that MacArthur that came back when he came back to the Philippines? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I thought I was going to get to meet MacArthur at one time. While we were at, at Guam, I was asked by someone to take a box of cigars and a pair of pajamas over to General MacArthur. And I said, oh boy, I'm going to get to meet the general. <laughs> so they put me on the admiral's boat and we flew over to the beach and I didn't get to see the general at all. I met an orderly and he told me. <laughs> the general thanks you, right? <laughs> I, 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 the general did thank me, I'm sure, <laughs> or thank the admiral that sent it over there. <laughs> oh. But that's how things happened in, that's the, right. in, the, in the Navy. Right. Then did you, you, uh, did you get out after the war was over? Did you get out of service after the war was over? Yes, ma'am. Oh. We, uh, well, after the Lingay and Gulf battle, the Sur we, we encountered a Japanese task force of a battleship, cruisers, and destroyers that were coming through Surigao Straits. And our intelligence was good enough that they knew that if we crossed that T with them coming up the Straits, their single file, that we would have a, a good chance of destroying them. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. We were able to destroy that entire task force coming up that straight single file mm -hmm. before they had a chance to do anything to our people that were out there on a ship mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. We went from Lingay and Gulf around Mindanao, and on Mindanao we were hit by a suicide plane. And the suicide plane hit your turret number two, which was just below and in front of where my battle station was. And at the time, I, I was standing up out of the, the director looking around to see if planes or whatever targets I might see. And I saw a, a plane coming straight toward our ship from dead ahead. And we didn't have a gun that could train on that area at all. And I watched him come on in, and the explosions were occurring all around him, and he kept coming right on in, and he hit on top, or hit near turret two. And of course, there was a big explosion and fire, and that's uh, next thing I remember. I was on a ladder going down to, to sick bay. I got a flash burn from the explosion, because I was standing there watching him, really. I could see his face, and I still, occasionally I'll have a, a, a dream at night, and I can still see that face and that Japanese coming right toward us in that plane. I bet. Do doesn't leave your memory bank. That's, that's the outstanding thing that I remember. Sure, right. Really, I guess is... The ship didn't sink, though, did it? The, sh the ship did not sink? Oh, no. It just it got didn't damaged? Sink. Oh, okay. We got hit the next day by another one at the bridge, and it killed the admiral and a number of high-ranking officers uh, and several sailors, too. Mm -hmm. But it didn't sink it. It disabled it, and we had to come back to the Navy Yard then for repairs, which took us, seemed to me, three or four weeks to get back to the Navy Yard. Which Navy Yard? The, on the West Coast or the one in the East Coast? Do you go on in, the California? In the West Coast. West Coast, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was quite a ways we, out, long way back. Yeah, we went into Mare Island there at the, on the west coast. Mm -hmm. And then what, what, tra what came next? Did you, till you stayed still in the service, even after the war was over? No, they, uh, 
I had orders when the ship came back to go to Gunnery Officer's Ordnance School at Washington, at the naval yard there. I went there and was there for three months, and I had further orders to go to the USS Atlanta, another heavy cruiser, and the commander there asked me if I'd be interested in staying on there as an instructor. And of course, I jumped at the chance. And I, I was there then for another three or four months, and then it was discharged in January of 46. Okay. Did your wife stay in Kentucky the whole time you were in? No, the she, she was in Washington with me oh, okay. while but, we were there. Right. But when you were in oh, now the Pacific, she was still at home? She was at home in Kentucky, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now that you're out of the service, what came next? What did you do after you got discharged from the service? Well, my wife's brother was in a dairy, small dairy, retail dairy business, and he wanted me to go in with him, and we put in a, and to, to put in a pasteurizer and a bottler and that sort of thing, and take care of that, and I finally agreed to do that. I was thinking of going back and work for DuPont, but I'd been gone for that long, and I wanted to stay at home for a while, and that's to be to be together with my wife. And so I took up his offer, really, and we put in a pasteurizing bottling machine and that sort of thing. And I took care of that. We produced the milk, bottled it, and he delivered it to retail customers in town. And I stayed there for three years, got interested in veterinary medicine while there, working with the cattle. There wasn't a veterinarian in our area, and I read a lot of veterinary books and that sort of thing, and got interested in veterinary medicine, and we talked about it with Margaret's brother, and we, at that time we had a, a dairy that uh, in a town away from there that was interested in buying it and my brother-in-law says well let's just sell it and you go ahead to vet school and I'll retire and that's what we did and I applied to Ohio State Vet School and was finally accepted there and I went to vet school then in 1949. Okay. What was, what was uh, Columbus like in those days when you went there? Was it right on the campus? Was the vet school right on the campus? The vet school was right on the campus. Mm -hmm. It's across the river now, I think. Where is it? Okay. Where the ag, ag is not across the river there, Olentangy. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And um, you, did you have any children by that at that point? We had one, one son born while we were in, in school. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, now, after you finished, was that, was that program four years? It was four years. Okay. So I finished there in 1953, went back to Kentucky, and practiced in Kentucky for 11 years. Private practice? In, in private practice. Well, there was three of us in a partnership and in my hometown. And Well, that was nice. We practiced there. I practiced there for 11 years, and then I got a call from Purdue, and they encouraged me to come and look and... I was happy where I was. We we had <coughs> excuse me <coughs> had two children at the <coughs> excuse me <coughs> we had two children at the time, and I was on the school board, and I was happy, and my family was happy and doing well. My children were in school, and I finally agreed to, to come to Purdue after a couple of visits here. What year was that? 1964. Okay. Uh, what was the campus like? In, uh, Lynn Hall had been built, though. There was a building, though, for the vet school, wasn't there? Oh, yes. Right. Yes. Okay. They'd graduated their, their first class in 63. Okay. The school was started in, in 59. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, when you first came then, you came in 64, what was your teaching? Uh, tell us a little bit about what your responsibilities when you My first responsibility, came. I was, uh, came as an associate professor of large animal clinics, and my teaching responsibility was in the classroom, I taught equine medicine, 
and in the clinic I worked with the students with the large animals, horses, cattle, sheep, goats, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what what was the enrollment at that time? Bob? If I recall correctly, it's 40 some students. Mm -hmm. Now they have, a, what, close to 70 or 72? Yes. They keep it, yeah. it's on the small side. Yes. All right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what was your research area when you first came? Was it an equine? Well, I, I, I wasn't a trained researcher at all. My goal was to, when I came to Purdue, was to be the best teacher I could be and to assist the students in uh, accomplishing their, their goal of graduating from a school of veterinary medicine. <coughs> And I looked upon almost every case as a research case. Is there anything that we can do differently that would improve the health of that animal and let him help him get well f faster and better and do it in a, in a humane manner? Did you do go out to the farms and things because you were in large animal? Did you make they make calls? I stayed at the clinic all the time. But but some of them would go out to the farm. Well, and yes, we had ambulatory clinicians that went to the farm and took care of the mm -hmm. animals on the farm. Right. Okay. And then you became a head of the large animal clinic in 1975. Yes, ma'am. So then things changed a little bit for you. You were the head of the department, and tell us a little bit about some of the projects and the challenges that you faced and handled? Well, at that time, uh, most people in, on farms had uh, either a few cows or a few pigs or a few sheep or horses or whatever. They didn't have the large farms uh, that they have now. Uh, the the farms were smaller in size in those they days? Were, they were much smaller in size. Uh, at least the animals on the farm were much smaller on the size, much smaller in size. In the 70s and 80s, uh, even in the late 60s, uh, they began to have larger operations, the swine operations were growing, and we had several large swine operations operating in the Indiana and the same thing with, with cattle, primarily with, with beef cattle. And dairies, there were some dairies that were growing and getting larger all of the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Just like now, there's, there's a dairy up, up north uh, that has about 25,000 cows. Fair, or Fair Oaks? Fair Oaks Farm. Mm -hmm. right. Then they, they came over from Holland, I think. Yes, sir. All right, okay. Uh, tell us, uh, what about students, Did the enrollment in... Uh, the school change? Enrollment has changed considerably. When I was in school, there were no females in veterinary medicine. When I came to Purdue, if I recall correctly, we had two, maybe three females. Now, they say the, the applications for veterinary school is 90% female. And that on a national average, they say that the veterinary population is approaching 50 percent. I'm not sure that that's accurate, right. but that's what I read right. and hear. Okay. When you first came, uh, took over, what was the placement? What sort of careers, where did they go when they finished? Did it some go into large animal or practice? Uh, at that time, uh, I, I, there was a smaller percentage of them that went into small animal practice than into large animal practice. But as if, as large animal practice has changed, as we moved from a few animals to a farm to a, a congregation of animals, uh, it's changed. The, the population now is, is going much larger small animal than it is large animal. Okay, 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 right. Tell us a little about your one of your research areas was acupuncture. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about that and how that interest. Uh, yeah, I became interested in acupuncture because I, I read an article that my daughter had written on acupuncture when she was in high school. This was in the 70s. And quite frankly, I didn't believe it. 
And I thought it was related to hypnosis or mind over body and that sort of thing. I, I had no idea that there was any truth in what I was reading. And what prompted her interest to write a paper on that? Was that for a, a school report? My daughter? Yeah. It was a school report. And I don't know how she came to write a paper on that. Interesting topic. <laughs> yeah, it pick. is. Yeah. But uh, she did, and I happened to read it, and that's where we started. Well, the more I thought about it, it, it seemed to me logical that animals would be the one that we should try it on to see if it really worked. And I found a, a ad that was going to have an acupuncture meeting, and I wrote and went to that meeting, and when I got there, I found that it was a meeting of physicians. And I sat, of course, with physicians in the room, and I was sitting close to a young fellow, and we were talking, and he found out that I was a veterinarian. He says, what are you doing here? And I says, I'm here, I guess, because I don't believe it. I says, what are you doing here? He says, well, I guess I'm here because I do believe it. I says, why? He says, well, I just came back from Vietnam not too long ago, and I saw where a lot of people there had been treated with acupuncture, and they swore by it. They thought it was the greatest thing that had come along. And he said, in talking to them, I thought it might be worthwhile for me to look into it, and that's why I'm here. And uh, the more I've studied it, I went to other meetings in acupuncture and decided that, well, let's, let's try it on animals and see what happens. And so... It had not been done on animals, been more on humans? It had been on humans. Mm -hmm. So I tried it on animals. The first one I tried it on was on a horse. I, I didn't think I could manipulate the mind of that horse. <laughs> if he didn't like something, he'd let me know about it. And of course, I grew up with horses and had worked with them. And, but this was a case of facial paralysis. The facial nerve comes down over the side of the jaw from the base of the ear and, and branches and runs around to their nose and to the lower lip. And the ones that I had seen, their, their nose would be pulled to one side and the lip on the affected side would droop and they would lose a lot of feed and that sort of thing. And so I was taught that nerve did not regenerate. Well, in, in acupuncture, they, they said the, you can regenerate nerve by using the electrical stimulation and the needles at certain points. So I said, well, this would be a good way to try it. And I had never seen a horse that had facial paralysis from a traumatic injury. And, and usually they're injured because of the, the bridle or the halter one was, was not fit exactly right and people were rough with it, jerk it, and they would injure the nerve because the nerve passes down right over the bone. And the horse that, that I started on had been that way, according to the owner, by about six months. And I told him, that, I don't know whether it'll work, but we'll try it. And he says, well, he's a good horse, let's try it. He says, I want to save him if there's any way. And we did, and we treated him daily. And by the third week, I noticed that he had a little sensation in that nose, in that side of the nose. You could tap him, tap him with a needle lightly, and he would, would let you know it. So we kept on treating him, and then we went to every other day, and then twice a week, and once a week for about uh, three to four months and he, he came back normal. And that really set me afire. <laughs> I thought, Had they tried anything before that to, for the paralysis? Had they tried anything on the horse before you tried the acupuncture? No. Oh. 
and they hadn't tried anything because we didn't know what to try. Right. Did they bring the horse to the vet school, or did you? No, they brought him to the vet school. Okay, so you did the, and so you kept him there for quite a while. Yeah, we kept him there for quite a while. I bet the owner was happy. He was happy, he, and I was happy. Right. Oh, both. Terrific. <clears throat> Then, uh, did you continue on with the acupuncture? And also, there was an international acupuncture uh, society. Were you involved with that? Yes, I was. Okay. International Veterinary Acupuncture uh -huh. Society. Yes, I, I went to that and attended attended the meetings and so forth. I knew all of the, all of the people there, and I tried it on cows, using it on the, in the flank of cows, opening the opening those up. Doing surgery on them, but placing needles in the in the animal, and and it takes about ten to fifteen minutes for that needle to start taking effect, for that action to start taking effect. But it seems to have a relaxing effect on the animal, and we take a scalpel and open that flank up, go in, palpate the rumen, and so forth. My back suture it up and the animal would stand there and not move. I've done that on cattle, done that on horses. I felt strong enough about it that I talked to a couple of students and they were willing to help and I said, let's try this for a student AVMA chapter meeting one night at their meeting. <laughs> and we did. I said, let's get a dog that we've never seen before and we'll put two needles in his leg We'll wait about 10 or 15 minutes and we'll try it and see if we can desensitize his abdomen and open up the abdomen. And we did that and the students opened up the abdomen and sutured it back up. Good afternoon. At 3.15 is a Wednesday worship. That sort of thing. And a few minutes he began to settle down and within a little over 10 minutes he he lay down and stretched out, it was perfectly calm. And they rolled him over on his back and opened him up, no problem at all. When they'd finished suturing him, turned him loose, he got up, turned around, and if he didn't come over and lick my hand. <laughs> Animals are lovely. So that's, uh, that's, I, I probably, as I thought about it afterward, I probably was crazy for attempting it. Because if it had failed, I would have been the laughing stock of the veterinary school. Are they still using it, the acupuncture? What's the status of it today uh, for, an, for with animals? Some are still using it in animals, not at Purdue. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, there's no one there that's using acupuncture. Okay. Is it used some in some other places in the United States? Oh on yes. Animals? Oh yes, it's okay. used quite a bit. Uh huh. And they use it on hum they use it on humans too, don't they? Use it on humans quite a bit, I'm uh -huh. told. Right. Okay. Okay. Now the school of vet med has cha tell of some changes. You had some deans when you came. Erskine Morse was the dean when you came, wasn't he? Yes. Sir. And then uh, what? Jack Stockton and Hugh Lewis. Hugh Lewis. Jack Stockton and then Hugh Lewis. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they brought each one brings a little. Uh, the the school has grown over time. Yes, the school has grown over time. It's it's changed uh, over time. Of course, they built a new diagnostic lab that's on the south campus now. And uh, what about a graduate program? Is that that's increased over time? The graduate program is increased. We had a graduate student that was doing his work in another area, but he worked in the clinic on horses. They were looking at the blood of the horse to see if it changed in hormone levels. And they found that it produced, it caused the animal to produce a hormone level that was, uh, give the animal a feeling of well-being or satisfaction, settled him down. And that's what the, the papers say about humans, that it, it gives you a feeling of well-being. Yeah, that's pretty, that's nice. Yeah, uh, the students' enrollment has increased over time. How long? Also, how long were you the head of the uh, large animal clinic? 
from 1975 to 1985. Okay. And then did you return to teaching and research? No, I, I retired. Oh, okay. Well, then t- what, we tell us a little about what you did in your retirement activities. Well, not, not a lot, I guess. But you decided to stay in the community. We stayed in the same community because our daughter and son-in-law and two grandchildren were here. Okay. We stayed with the grandchildren a lot. Our our daughter and son-in-law both work there at Arnett Clinic, and my wife felt that we should be close to those grandchildren and help them in any way we could. Right. And you had two son. You had a son. Do you have a son? We have a son that's in Pittsburgh. Okay, okay. Does he have children? No, he and his wife do not have children. He's in an emergency room there in Pittsburgh. He has yes. his, his a medical doctor? Yes, sir. Uh, did he go to Purdue? No, he went to uh, Indiana University. And then to IU Med, Center, med School? And, and then to IU Med oh, School. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, he went to Duke University before he went to... Uh, you made school. Okay, that's neat. You got uh, some awards. You got the um, uh, Distinguished Alumnus Award at one time too, and any other, and some other awards. Um, you got the the IVMA President's Award. Yes, sir. All right. Mm-hmm. Where'd, you, where'd you get all this? Oh, I have to do my research. Let me talk about Chauncey Village. How's Chauncey Village changed since you've been here? I usually ask the people that, particularly what it was like when you first came, 60s and 70s. It's, it's changed a lot. Has it gotten bigger? Uh, seems to me it's much bigger. Much more traffic, much more, a lot more people there. It may be because there's more students on campus. It's a combination. Well, I guess so. But it seems uh, much bigger. There's a lot more activity going on there than... There was a service station there on the corner of uh, Grant Street and State Street when I first came here. Mm-hmm. Right. I went to that station. Davis, Bill Davis owned that. Yeah. And then he moved out there to uh, Yeager Road in 52. Yeah. And then he gave that up, and now it's BP. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are some of the other, any other activities that you got engaged in when you retired? Did you do any traveling? We traveled some. We we had a, a little orange grove in Florida. Do you have and a house down there too? We we got a condo down there, and in fact we still have it. Uh, I gave the little orange grove to my children, and they had it for f- about four years. And some lady from Miami came along and wanted to buy it, and so they I, I said sell it, sell it, sell it because the things were changing a lot in that business, and they did. And then we have a little farm in Kentucky that my wife and I reworked an old tenant house there, and we spent some time there. And you still it. have it? Still have it. Okay. Does somebody ta- do you raise it? Is there any crops on the farm? No crops. Had cattle. You still have cattle? Still have cattle. Okay. Raised hay and co- hay and uh, pasture. Okay. Raised tobacco until the tobacco program by the government went into effect, and they don't raise tobacco anymore. Okay, all right. What did you do with the little orange grove? Did you have? Did you work in the orange grove? Was tell us a little about that. I used to work some in there when we'd go down in the summer. I'd sucker it and I'd spray underneath and that sort of thing. Did you bring back? You had to bring back oranges for your friends when you came back. Yeah, that's right. Had to bring back a carload of oranges. Otherwise, you're not allowed back. That's right. <laughs> the children, I'm sure the children enjoyed it. Oh, they enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. They enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Whereabouts in, whereabouts in Florida was it located? Lake Wales. Okay, is that? Just south of Orlando. Oh, okay. On US 27. Orlando has changed for you over time, I bet. Orlando has changed tremendously. Since Disney moved to town. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, let me ask you: Do you have a favorite a favorite Purdue tradition? Any tradition that sticks in your mind? A Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us? Tradition. Mm-hmm. Well, one that my wife and I thoroughly enjoyed was the 
band Clee Club and the Paduettes. We went to all of the Christmas shows. We'd go to the games, enjoy the football, the, the band playing at the football games. We left to see them march in and march out and left to hear the Paduettes. And we'd left to go to the Victory Varieties, I think they were called at right. the time. I missed those. Those were very good. We enjoyed those very much. Right. They made... Uh, they were still going on when I came, and sometimes when my brother and sister-in-law would come, we would do that as part of the things to do on the weekend. Yeah. You know, but they're not anymore. <laughs> no, I, they stopped those. I don't know why, but uh, it may have been too hard to get the people. I don't know. Yeah, right. How but, about uh, an outstanding event in your life? Did something come to mind? Well, probably the outstanding event in my mind, I don't... I don't like to remember it particularly, but uh, I still pops up in my dreams every once in a while, and that's this Japanese plane coming at us uh, as it before it hit us. Okay. I was standing there watching him and saw him come in, and I could still see his expression there in my dream. Right. <laughs> that doesn't leave your memory bank. Yeah. And any closing comments that you'd like to share with the researchers? In summary, anything special you'd like to say? Well, I thoroughly enjoyed my, my time at, at Purdue. I enjoyed the students very much. When I came here, I said my responsibility was primarily to the students. Uh, it was to do the best I could to help them accomplish their goals. And next, it was to the owners of the animals that brought their animals into the clinic, that I should do the best I could to, to meet their needs and to do it in a, in, a, in a humane manner as far as the animal was concerned. And I've, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoyed both the students and the, the clients. Yeah, right. Good. I was fortunate enough to, to get some teaching awards, which I very much appreciate it, and uh, I don't know why, but uh, maybe it was because uh, that was the reason that I felt I should be here, is to work with the students, and, and I enjoyed them. My wife enjoyed this, the student wives. Some of them were married at the time, and she enjoyed them because she was a student wife while I was in school. So she could identify. She could identify with them. Right. Yeah. Do you keep in touch? With, still keep in touch with some of the students? Oh yes, I still hear from some of them. That's nice. Yeah, it's good I, to share memories and things like that. I enjoy, I enjoy enjoy hearing to from them. Okay. Thank you very much. And I learned a lot from the students. Right. Uh, they they have they have their own thoughts and thinking about things, and they will bring up things that, that I might not think of. So hopefully it was reciprocal. They learned something from me, and I learned from them. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Page. This has been very nice. This ends the interview. Thank you very much.